Okay, we're going to have a look at question two of November final exam 2022. Now, question two, we focus on geomorphology, right? We're going to have a look at river processes and all those concepts. Now, if you look at our first question, refer to drainage basin A and B below. Match your descriptions in question 2.1.1 to 2.1.A by simply answer, is it A or is it B? Okay, but before we look at the question, just just quickly look at the diagrams that's been provided. Immediately, if I look at drainage basin A, I can see a lot less tributaries. Okay, so I'm going to definitely say this is low density. And if you look at B, many more tributaries. So that's going to be a high density. So I think if we look at the questions that's going to focus, we're going to look at factors that influence the different types of drainage basins that we see in A and B. Immediately A, less water than B. A, less surface runoff than B. Okay, but let's have a look at the questions. 2.1.1, the higher drainage density, what's it going to be? A or B, we already identify it as B. Why? Because we can see many rivers, many streams, many tributaries. So the correct answer will be B. Then if you look at question 2.1.2, a lower infiltration rate. So that means when the water infiltrate, right? Now, definitely B, because we can see more surface runoff. So the water infiltrates much more over here. So just because it's a low density doesn't mean it gets less rainfall. It might be depending on the underlying rock. Now it might be permeable or impermeable. Now what's the difference between permeable rock and impermeable rock? Permeable rock allows water to infiltrate. Okay. Impermeable doesn't allow water to infiltrate. So if you look at B, we might say it's impermeable rock. So the water is rather going to be on the surface. Okay, same with vegetation cover. Vegetation cover promotes infiltration. Okay, when there's sparse vegetation cover, not a lot of vegetation cover, right, it's going to look like B. So the correct answer for 2.1.2 is also B. Now if you look at question... 2.1.3, I've just mentioned that, denser vegetation, so the area is covered with vegetation, trees, plants, okay, and like I've mentioned, it promotes infiltration, okay, so we can say at drainage basin A, we can say it's dense vegetation, because the water is rather going to infiltrate, so the correct answer for 2.1.3 is going to be A. Okay, 2.1.4, higher soil moisture content. Now, if you think of soil moisture, the soil, right, it's going to be full of moisture. And that answer is definitely going to be B because there's lots of surface runoff. The water is right on top of the surface. Now, if we look at question 2.1.5, develop on less resistant type of rock, that's on A. Why? Because less resistant type of rock is more prone to erosion. So we experience more deposition. So that will be drainage basin A. Okay, we've mentioned a couple of seconds ago the permeability of rock. Permeability when the rock is permeable, it allows water to infiltrate. If it's an impermeable, it doesn't allow water to infiltrate. So our correct answer for 2.1.6 will be B. It's impermeable. It doesn't allow the water to infiltrate. So if we just go back to the diagram, you will say more surface runoff being experienced. Okay, now last question regarding drainage basin A and B. 2.1 second last high stream order 2.1.7 that's B now what is stream order when we have many tributaries 
it's going to be a high stream order. I'm quickly going to explain this to you. That's, for instance, drainage basin B. Let's just mention A. It's not the, exactly the same as our diagram. Remember, a single stream or tributary is known as a first stream order. Now, where two first stream orders meet, it's a second stream order. Now, the rule of thumb is the formula goes as such. A first and a first stream order makes a second stream order. If it's a first stream order and a second stream order, it stays a second. A second plus a second stream order becomes a third stream order. A second plus a third stays a third. A third plus a third makes a fourth stream order. Now, if you quickly do these two with me, we can have a look. There is a first stream order and a first stream order that creates a second. There is a first and a first that creates a second. A second and a second creates a third. There's a first stream order, a first stream order, that's a second stream order. A first and a second stays a second. A third stream order and a second stream order stays a third. There's a first stream order and a first stream order, that's a second. A first and a second stays a second. A second and a third stays a third stream order. Now, there's a first stream order, a first, a first, and a first. A first and a first makes a second. A first and a second stays a second. A first and a second stays a second. Now that answers your question. The higher the stream order, the higher the density. So the correct answer will be B. Now, if we have a look at the graph below, it represents the drainage basin. Now if we look at it, the number of streams, and the stream order, right? Now, if you look at the question, right, 2.1.8, which drainage basin does it represent? Now, obviously, we can see the stream order is quite high, so it's definitely going to be B as your correct answer. And let's quickly move to our next question. Okay. In question 2.2.2, .2 we need to go and choose the correct answer. Now, if we look at this diagram, the sketch has been given to us that we need to answer, right? It's river capture that's been indicated over here. Now, first and foremost, interestingly enough, there's drainage basin A, there's drainage basin B. Now, what is river capture? It's when one more energetic river steals water from another river, okay, or intercepts the water from a, another river. Now, as you can see, this is where the interception takes place. That's known as headward erosion. And eventually, it will start to erode through to River B. Okay, but let's have a look at the question that follows regarding this topic. Okay, 2.2.1. What type of erosion is responsible for lengthening of the river at A? And I've just mentioned it over there. It's headward erosion. Okay. If we look at question 2.2.2. The landform caused by this type of erosion in question 2.2.1, the correct answer will be C. It's going to be a gorge because it's in a high laying area. As you can see, this is the escarpment. Now, this is a classic example of river capture that's taking place where the one river is at a lower altitude than the river A situated over there, or river B in this case, right? So, where this river capture takes place, a gorge being formed. Now, if we quickly look at 2.2.3, River C will eventually capture River B because it flows on A. This is going to be a gentler, steeper gradient and over a softer or harder rock. Now, first and foremost, we know that River C, let's just go back to our diagram, 
This is river C. River C steals the water from river B. Correct? Right? Now, the question states, the river C will eventually capture river B because it flows on a gentler gradient, as you can see, and is the rock softer or harder? It erodes, so it's definitely going to be softer. Because that's the reason why headward erosion is taking place. Okay, so that we can add, uh, uh, mention. So the correct answer, now we need to choose the correct combination. The correct combination is going to be C. If you look at our next question, once again, it's on the river capture, 2.2.4. River C is known as the Capture River. That's the pirate stream. Okay, it's the one stealing the water. That's what we can add over there. Okay, I can quickly identify to you, for instance, the misfit is going to be F. Okay, the captive stream is going to be, that's the captive, that's the captor, that's the misfit, and that D is the wind gap. Because this is where the river will eventually dry up because it's been intercepted over there. So where you got this 90 degree angle, it's also known as the elbow of capture. Okay, so our correct answer there. Now 2.2.5 feature D is referred to as the, let's just quickly have a look at it. We've already identified it as the wind gap. So the correct answer over there will be C. 2.2.6, the resultant fluvial landform of river capture at E is a, let's see if we've mentioned it, let's quickly have a look. Guys, okay, so that's an elbow of capture, but they asked to reveal landform at 2.2.6. And the correct answer will be B, a waterfall, because that's where the interception takes place. And as you can see, the headwood erosion causes a nick point. Okay. Our last question, 2.2.7. The characteristics of River F are that it flows inside what type of valley and a wider or narrow valley? and the volume of water will increase or decrease. So, the valley will be wider because river capture is taking place, and we can also mention that there's going to be a decrease. Okay, now if you quickly go back at F, as you can see, keep in mind the water has been stolen over here. So eventually what's going to happen with this stream? It's probably going to turn into a non perennial river. Okay. Because its waters have been captured by River C. So if we go back, it kind of explains the question. The valley is going to be wide, right? Because it used to be a perennial river, but not anymore. And because the water has been captured, the water volume is going to decrease. So our correct answer is going to be C. Okay. Question two. Now what we have over here is a drainage basin. All right. It shows us a bunch of information. It shows us these keys that we can use for information. All right. It shows us the runoff in all the different directions. That's the catchment areas. Right, we have the forest, key for forest, 
right? We have the permanent river, and then we have a cross section of the water tables of Y and Z. Okay, very important. The small dotted line over here represent the water table during the rainy season. Let's just add it over there, right? And this is during dry season. Now this is during rain season and dry season. Now immediately, what can I see the difference between Y and Z? Z is going to be a permanent river because there's water inside the river during rain season, rainy season, as well as dry season. There, but if we look at why it's a periodic river or a non pronal river, because there's only water inside the river during rainy season. But during dry season, it's below the river bed. Okay, over here we can also see infiltration, groundwater runoff, obviously soil promotes it, especially vegetation promotes it. Okay, but let's look at the questions that's being asked on this diagram that's been given to us, question 2.3.1. The river illustrated in the sketch is definitely a permanent river, right? We can see that there's infiltration taking place and it's a solid blue line, right? And you can see the mouth of the river as well, right? This is the source of the river. Okay, over here is the mouth. So it's almost like a longitudinal profile of a river that we see in this diagram. So the correct answer for 2.3.1 will be permanent. Okay. 2.3.2 .2. State two characteristics of the river system evident in the sketch. This is a very extra, excellent question. Now, just characteristics that we can see over here. First and foremost, have a look at this drainage basin pattern. Doesn't this look familiar? Right? It's probably our most common one, if I can just draw it roughly. What type of pattern is this? This is a dendritic pattern, right? And pay attention the high water table. The water table is very close to the surface, okay? And we can also say it's a second order stream if you go and calculate it like I did in the previous question, and it's a perennial river. So I'm going to mention a couple of characteristics. First and foremost, we've mentioned it's a dendritic pattern. It's a very high water table. Okay, and we can say it's a perennial river. It flows all year round, or permanent river. Now, if we look at question 2.3.3, Give evidence from the sketch that the surface runoff is greater at A than B. Now let's go to, okay, there's more surface runoff at A than at B. Okay, so what does surface runoff mean? It means we will be able to see the water on top of the surface. Okay, groundwater runoff is when the water infiltrates. Now they want us to provide evidence if we look at this diagram. Simple reason why. If you quickly look at B, there's more vegetation. And we can see it in the keys, there's a forest over there. As you can see, there's less vegetation at A. And what can we say? So, there's less vegetation. And we can also say there's more tributaries feeding channel A. Now, if I just go back to that point, right, another thing is, you can see this river 
it's all by itself where the river B. It's only one tributary. Now look at how many tributaries join. There's confluence taking place when two tributaries join. We can also see the river channel is wider over there. So the volume of water is much more, right? And it's at a lower gradient. We can also mention that point. B is at a higher gradient. Okay, so we can almost say it's like a source of the river. Less water volume. Now as we move down, more tributaries start joining. Increase the volume of water. We can see a wider river channel as well. Okay. And we can identify it where A is. A is in the middle course. And B is in the upper course. Oh, I felt this at the wrong point. Let me just do that. A is in the middle course. B in the upper course. Okay, our next question asks 2.3.4. Refer to C. Which one of the cross sections, Y or Z, represents the river at point C? Now let's just quickly go back. So which one, Y or Z, represents C? Now I would say immediately Z. Why? You can see because of the amount of volume of water, it's in the lower course, there's going to be water inside the river, even during dry season. So the correct answer over there will be Z. Now give a reason for your answer. You can say because the river intercepts the dry and wet water table. Now going back to our diagram, you can see our water table, as you can see. I just want to use a different. As you can see, there's the water table. There's true flow and there's the river flowing. So that's where interception takes place. And that's the reason, even during dry season, there will be water into our riverbed, and there's wet season where the water volume increases and will be greater in volume. Okay. How will a decrease in precipitation affect the following? Precipitation is rain. Okay, how will it affect the water table? Obviously, it will lower the water table because there will be less infiltration. And secondly, what will happen with the type of river? It will go from a permanent river okay, to a Episodic or non perennial river. Because it won't have constant water that's been added to the strainage basin. Okay. Let's quickly have a look at question number two, grade 12. Okay, what do we have here? We have a sketch with different landforms that's been presented to us. Immediately what I can tell you, just to identify, we can see the river meandering. Okay, definitely meandering taking place over here. And we know where this river meandering taking place, usually in the middle and lower course. Over here, what do we see over here? We have a floodplain. plain. 
Okay, what's been created at D is known as a Oxbow Lake. And then there's a cross section from B to C. Now, remember, water flows fastest on the outside bends. So B is known as the undercut slope. The water flows slower in the inside bends, so we have deposition taking place on the inside bends, and that is known as the slip-off slope. And as you can see, this looks like the mouth. So I will definitely, we can cancel middle course, it's definitely the lower course. If I just look at this diagram. Okay, now let's quickly have a look at the questions that's being asked regarding this. Okay, the fluvial landforms illustrated in the sketch are mainly found, and we just answer that, in the lower course. The reason why I chose lower, lower course because we have the mouth situated over there and there's more prominent landforms such as oxbow lakes that develops and big sized mehandas that also develop and a well established floodplain as well. Now if you look at our next question, identify the fluvial landform A on the sketch. A is a meander, it's how the river curves and bends, okay, so we can just write our correct answer over here, now 2.4.3, draw a rough cross section from B to C, and that's the question that I discussed with you where we have our undercut slope and slip of slope. Remember, the water flows fastest on the outside bends of the river. So there's B and C. So I'm just going to draw a diagram that's been pointed out to us over there, and I'm going to draw the cross section from there. So as the river meanders, right, as you can see, the water flows fastest on the outside bends. Remember, we can't steer water. So as you can imagine, it dashes into this riverbed. Now, what we experience on the outside bends is erosion. Right, because the water flows faster. And the outside bends, now there's A, oops, it's B to C. Just do that again from B to C. So we experience erosion on the outer bends, and that is known as the undercut slope. On the inside bends, the material that's being eroded are being deposited because it flows much slower over there, and that is known as the slip off slope. Now, to construct the cross-section from B to C, this is what it's going to look like. Okay, there's B, there's the water, let me just draw the water like this, there's the water, and there's C. Okay, so B, the undercut slope, C, the slip of slope. So just imagine you and your mate are standing opposite each other from the river channel. If you had to go and jump in at B, it's going to be really deep. We at C is going to be shallow because the deposition is taking place on the inside bend. Now, if you look at the next question, where will erosion take place at B and C? And the correct answer will be B. Give a reason for your answer to question 2.4.3. River flows faster. At B, okay, okay, we can say just at the outer bank. Okay. Now, 2.4.4, in a paragraph of approximately eight lines, describe the process, 
right, that results in the change of fluvial landforms A to an oxbow lake at D. Okay, just want to go back to our diagram. Okay, there's our oxbow lake. And I'm going to show you the diagram, how it basically happens. Okay. Now, as the river continues to flow, we know that erosion takes place at the undercut slope. Now, as the let me just quickly make my page bigger. As the river continues to flow, okay. Now we already established that we have the undercut slope and the slip of slope. Now as we experience continuous erosion and the undercut slope, erosion will take place. Same will happen at the next Mehanda bend. So we have erosion taking place. Okay, so the outer bank keeps on being eroded. Okay. The position of the being taking place on the inside bends, as we can see, like we looked at the previous question. And eventually, the neck becomes more narrower. And eventually, what will happen over time, where on the outside banks, this river will erode straight through, creating the Oxbow Lake. Because the river is going to take the shortest route as it flows downwards and we have an oxbow lake that develops because of it. So instead of the river following the meandering loop, it's just going to throw straight through. Now, they ask you to describe it, if you just quickly have a look at it and we write it down in paragraph form, the outer bank erodes And deposition happens on the inside bend. The meander loop develops. Okay, and eventually during rainy season or flooding, during flooding, the river cuts through the meander neck. And lastly, meander loop separated from the mainstream creating an oxbow lake. Okay, so that answers our questions on meandering taking place. Once again, please take note on these landforms, like we discussed. The river that curves and bends is known as meandering. The outside bends are known as the undercut slope, where erosion takes place. Inside bends, the slip of slope, we experience deposition. Now there's an example, you can see Eventually, on the outer banks, it will erode straight through, creating the meander loop. And during flooding, the river will just change its course, cutting off the meander neck, creating the oxbow lake, as you can see over there. Right, let's quickly move on to our next question. And this is river management. Right, management is to protect, to be sustainable of our catchment areas. I mean, we've just seen on the news 
the difficulty we experience in Hammond's crawl regarding cholera, for example, we really, really need to manage our river systems, our drainage basins, because we consume the water and we need to protect it being sustainable for future generations. Now, if you quickly look at the map that's been given to us, and the map that's given to us is the Moira uh, River catchment area. Now, this is where Gauteng is situated in the northwest. Okay, this indication where dams have been built in the Moy River. Right, there's a Moy River in Pochestrum as well. Then you've got the Bonderfontein situated over there. You've got another dam, Donald's Dam, situated close to Kruger's Dorp. Now, if you look at the information that's been given to us, the Moy River has two major tributaries namely Wonderfontein Spruit. Here you can see it. And Loeb Spruit. Now, as you can see, these two joining up together forms the Moy River. Okay, so there's confluence taking place over there. The Donaldson Dam in the upper Wonderfontein Spruit receives water from various sources, such as sewage facilities. Now, keep in mind, when we look at sewage facilities, it's usually purification, they clean it, right? This mining area is very close to this western area, right? Kruger's Dorp is also known for its mining activities. And we have informal settlements close to these areas. Now, once again, all three of them, the mining areas, the informal settlements, and the sewage facilities have a negative impact on the quality of water. Now, mining is a big culprit in polluting our rivers, as well as informal settlements, because there's a lack of basic needs and services, such as sewage, right? So people still use the rivers to wash their clothes. They don't have proper sewage systems in place, so much of that sewage goes straight into the river channels. Now, if you look at the Moy River flows south through agricultural land, now, that's another culprit that we experience and river management. Because what does that farmers do? They tend to use fertilizers, pesticides, for example, and often they get washed into the rivers. And that has a negative effect as well, especially what we see in the Hart Dam with the eutrophication, the excess growth of algae because of the fertilizers that's been washed into those dams. Okay, and eventually, as you can see, it will join the main river, the Vol River. Okay, the main types of land used in the Moy River catchment area is crop farming and grazing. Now, according to the Department of Water Affairs, irrigation and farming are the two major activities polluting the waters of the Moy River drainage basin. Why? It's a simple reason why, because they remove natural vegetation, there's deforestation taking place. There's also mining taking place, as you can see, small scale di diamond diggings taking place. Once again, deforestation taking place. Okay, and so this happens, the floodplain are being destroyed and the wetlands and natural habitats. Okay, what is the abbreviation DWA and the extract stands for? It stands for the Department of Water Affairs. So we can just write the correct answer over there. If we quickly have a look at question 2.5.2. Okay, refer to the case study and identify two sources that negatively impact the quality of the Donaldson Dam. Now remember, they want to ask about the Donaldson Dam, not about the Moy River, right? Not about Luopsprate. They want to know about Donaldson Dam. What activities has a negative impact over here on Donaldson Dam? And they've mentioned the sewage facilities, the mining areas, and the informal settlements. So there's these three. So let's just write them down. So it's a case study. If you look at the questions so far, and lastly, Mining, so you could have mentioned any one of those. Now, if you quickly look at question 2.5.3, why are the water sampling points testing 
points important. Now, if we just go back to our diagram to see where the water testing points are, and you can see that indicated the water so sampling point is triangle that's been pointed out over there. As you can see, the testing points is all along the Moy River, situated over there. And there's one where the confluence is taking place. Now, it's vitally important because they need to check the purity of the water. If it's polluted, is it safe for human consumption? Right? Vital factors are plays a role. They need to see what's if the amount. Is the water clean enough to consume? Right? Is it, is it going to be a danger for the surrounding ecosystem? Okay, so let's make a couple of pointers from it. Why is it so important? First, we can mention it. Okay, it's to test the water quality. And if there's pollution, to identify the source of pollution. Okay to preserve the ecosystem. And to ensure safe water for the public. Now, if you look at question 2.5.4, how do agricultural practice in the Moy River catchment area cause water pollution to the water systems? I've mentioned it earlier. First and foremost, when they use pesticides, right, that runs into the river. That's like poison to protect the crops. Okay, fertilizers. Ending up in the river. And lastly, we can also move the removing of vegetation, causing deforestation. So if you remove the vegetation, we increase the runoff. And lastly, which I would like to mention, with removing vegetation, it causes soil erosion. So it might lead to the dam silting up eventually. Now, if you quickly look at question 2.5.5, Suggest three sustainable strategies that can be implemented in order to maintain the quality of the water in the Moy River catchment area. Now, first and foremost, what can we do, right, to improve the water quality, right? First and foremost, let's start with the agricultural sector. So let's concentrate on the negative, the negative, uh, the culprits in the case study. What was the culprits? Mining was, a, was one of those. The agricultural sector was one of those, and informal sector was one of those. So how, what can we do, what strategies can we put in place to keep this water clean in this catchment area? So let's start with the farming sector. What can we do? We can remove, decrease, not remove, decrease the use of fertilizers. and pesticides. Right, another, what we can do is we can practice green agriculture, more environmentally friendly agriculture. We can reduce deforestation. Okay, another 
sustainable strategy we can introduce is reduce pollution from mines. What we can do in informal settlements, create awareness campaigns. Educating the public. And lastly, once again with the informal settlements, we can improve infrastructure For instance, sewage plants. Okay, and that's it for question two.